Hey everybody, I'm Christy Wilhelmy from Garden Nerd. I want to welcome you to a live q and I've decided to do on YouTube today instead of Facebook uh, about pest control. So I'm going to answer some questions that I got in our final webinar that we did yesterday called Winning the Pest Control Game. Uh, a lot of really great questions came in and I thought I would share them with you. Now, if you have a question, you can post it and I might be able to see it. I'll try. Um, I'm not sure exactly if the chat shows up for me to see. A uh, couple of announcements, well, just one announcement before I get started. Registration for our online pest control course, Creating a Healthy Garden, closes today. Today is the last day you can register. I won't be offering this course again until the fall. And so this is your last chance to get in, grab a seat before um, it closes. It closes at 6 p.m. Pacific time. June 2nd, that's today. So, uh, this if, oh, and if you want to go to gardennerd.com slash healthy garden, that's where you'll find all the information about how to register. That's garden nerd with one N, G A R D E N E R D dot com slash healthy garden. So, go to gardennerd.com slash healthy garden, check out the online course, Creating a Healthy Garden, and Hopefully that will help you, well not, I know, it will help you garden better this season and up your gardening game to the nth degree. So, we had a fantastic webinar series in the last week. Our last one was yesterday. Here are some questions that I answered live. And of course, if you want to post in the, in the chat below, go ahead. All right, and if I can't answer them now, I will answer them. Hello from Oregon, hi welcome <laughs> and if if I can't uh, answer them now I'll, I'll follow up on the chat later okay so uh, question number one this year has been horrible for aphids I had plenty of ladybug predators I sprayed off the aphids but my cabbage kale etc have been overwhelmed what do I do it's a good question now I I know from my experience that in warm winter climates it's really best to plant those uh, cabbages, brassicaceae plants, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, and kale um, in the fall because they are less susceptible to ants and aphids and other critters that are trying to take over those plants. Um, if you live in a warm winter climate, I don't even recommend growing brassicaceae in the spring because they just get full of aphids and that's what happens. So strategic planning for next year um, is one avenue to take. The other is uh, one of the, the techniques that I shared in the webinar yesterday, and I go a lot more into in creating a healthy garden, is about how you can put down worm castings as a line of defense against aphids. Why is that? That's because ant, um, aphids are sucking insects, or so mealybugs, white fly, leafhoppers, and there are some others, but those are the basics right there. And when you put worm castings down around the plant, the plant takes it up into its leaves and stems and it releases, it is, there's something in worm castings that helps repel insects that are sucking insects. It's an enzyme called chitinase, it's pronounced chitinase, and it is something that when plants, when um, insects take, take it in, it happens to dissolve their exoskeletons. So it's a great tool as a pest control to use in your garden when you have an aphid infestation. So yes, ladybugs are a great idea, as are planting other beneficial insectary plants that attract lacewings, etc. And those guys will help keep things at bay. Uh, I also have a video on the channel that is about how to get rid of an aphid infestation in three steps, so check that one out. All right, next question. What do I do about grasshoppers, but worse of all, leaf miners? My charred beet greens, green beans, leaves were all devastated really beyond just picking on picking off the infested leaves the last two years have been terrible before that i never had them any suggestions okay grasshoppers grasshoppers i just did a video about grasshoppers so you can watch that go the to the garden nerd youtube channel and look for that also uh they run in a three-year cycle so i'll let i'll let that video answer that part of the question leaf miners now one of the things i talk about in the course is uh, the importance of learning about what eats what. So when there are leaf leaf miners, sorry, the question was about leaf miners. When there are leaf miners, um, I like to research how to find. You know, what are their um, what are their 
um, pre predators, what likes to eat them, right? So there's usually a beneficial nematode for that or something, uh, depending on what it is. And in this particular case, and I've done a video about this, uh, I, I have sprayed beneficial nematodes on the leaf surfaces for um, specifically for leaf miners. It's the nematode is Heterorhabditis bacteriophora, flora, flora, yeah, HB for short. So you can usually get a, a package sent to you in the mail, dilute that in water and spray that on the leaf surfaces. I, I only had to apply once and my leaf miner problem was gone. So that's something I recommend. Okay, uh, da, da, da. what do you do for white flies? I'm gonna go back to the same answer that I posted or that I said about in the beginning in terms of aphids. Aphids and white flies and mealybugs, they're all sucking insects. So the first thing I would do is put down worm castings. That's gonna help defend your plants. It will help boost their vitality and ward off the, the white fly insects. Also, white flies usually show up when there's a lack of air circulation. So if you can thin out the plant that's got a white fly and if it's in a corner where there are tall hedges or things like that, that's, uh, that's gonna be one of the best ways. Increase air circulation and those guys are less likely to take up residence. All right, next question. Are there pest insects that lay their eggs in the soil? Oh, so many, so very many. And I'm gonna check because I saw that a question came in except that I can't see it. Where is it? Live chat, how do I see? This is what I don't know how to do. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Your question came up, but I can't tell where it went. Um, none of the messages, live chat, all messages are visible. There they are, I found them, yay. Okay, uh, aphids are in brute force. They are attracted to nitrogen and, oh, come back. Ah, oh, come on. I'm trying to read your comment. Sorry, it's a bit lengthy, so let me just. Uh, and, uh, they're in brute, da, 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 nitrogen. And the ones they hatch in, from April to now are laid last fall. They're born, oh, I'm sorry, it's just too, too fast. It goes away too quickly for me to read it. Uh, they're born pregnant and 100 babies, 100, with 100 live babies. I love this trick of worm castings. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry, it took me so long to read that because I'm terrible at this. Um, I take pictures most of the time and post them on social media. I don't do a lot of live videos because I'm, I'm not a Luddite, I'm actually very computer savvy, but this is not my strong suit. All right, all right, yay. So try the worm casting trick, it's gonna work for you, I promise. Um, are there insect pests that lay their eggs in the soil? Yes, so many. And in fact, that's a lot of what I teach inside Creating Healthy Garden is how to find out about their life cycle, interrupt it, and find the solutions that you need in order to eradicate, not eradicate, we are striving for balance. Uh, to, <laughs> thank you, Steve, I'm <laughs> doing great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Steve and I went to high school together. Uh, anyway, so yes, yeah, so there are a lot of eggs in the soil out there, good and bad, mostly the bad ones, there is a predator out there that can interrupt the life cycle of that one. So if you wanna join Creating a Healthy Garden, I will teach you how to do that research and find that out for yourself. It's a lot of fun, it's one of my favorite things to do. All right, I'm losing tomatoes and cucumbers to something at the moment. Does a floating row cover really stop mice and rats? That depends. I have had some rats or really squirrels pull their way through floating row cover. I've had crows rip holes in floating row cover, but for the most part, most of the time, it works. Floating row cover, for those who aren't familiar, is a, a white gauzy fabric that's synthetic that allows water and sunlight to penetrate through. So I use it a lot to keep bugs off my plants and to keep critters from getting into the fruits. So for example, we're in squash season. I will leave my squash plants open until they set fruit, my winter squash, right? Because they usually set fruit and then ripen. Uh, and then I cover them with floating rug cover, pin it all the way down, all the way around. And I'm talking four corners. I use eight pins for a four by four bed. So the four corners and then the spaces in between. And that keeps them out. And once they're pollinated, they're going to, you know, ripen in safety, which is great. And you can water right through that and they'll, they'll ripen nicely. Uh, sorry, shorter comments next time. Balance, yes. <laughs> Thanks, EL. Uh, all right. 
So, uh, yes, and also we also are setting rat traps because that is kind of the only way to control the population around here. Uh, live trapping honestly does not do the trick. They're not that foolish, but uh, the snap traps are the things we use to keep them under control because the breeding cycles of most uh, vermin are so much quicker than the predator cycles. So, for example, a coyote may have a litter of five, three, four, whatever um, pups a year, but rats produce every six weeks, they can produce a new litter of, of critters. So rat traps, I'm, I'm vegetarian, I've been for 30 years, but I still use rat traps because we gotta keep balance in the garden and that's how I do it. Um, my cat catches them every once in a while, so having a cat is a really good idea, but uh, it, she likes to eat them stem to stern, and that's not healthy for her, especially if the neighbors are using poison. So A, no poison ever, all right? Uh, we use barn cats in addition to trap. Yes, barn cats are a great idea, Steve. Um, Mittens is our barn cat, although she is in at night, and she's getting older, so she's less inclined to um, go hunting. But that's a great solution. Okay. Next question, do row covers prevent pollination or do I just take them off for short periods of time during the day? Yes, so they will prevent pollination. So you can A, either hand pollinate, which I, I use a watercolor paintbrush to go out and pollinate my squash in the morning before the flowers wither. And, or you can take the floating row cover off during the day, cover it up at night because outside of squirrels and some other critters, most vermin and other creatures are nocturnal. So the ones that are gonna come and like chew up your squash completely, those guys are nocturnal and they don't generally uh, do their damage during the day. So covered, covered at night, open during the day or a part of the day, that works great. The morning is best because that's when the flowers are open. So, <laughs> ick, <laughs> nice, uh, yeah. Okay, and you know, and that's true if you have cages over your garden too, you can open the doors during the day, close them at night. That's what we wanna try and keep them at bay at night. Uh, go out at night during, honestly, go out at night during, <laughs> during the dark and wear a headlamp and you will, that's exactly right, Steve. So fighting slugs overnight. I put on a headlamp and go outside at night and the, the activity is off the chain. You will see so many people. I just got a notification, not sure why I'm late. Uh, did I miss the fungus gnats? Oh, did I talk about fungus gnats? I have not, I can do that. Um, we'll talk, okay, so fungus gnats. Let's talk about fungus gnats. But basically, you know, you'll see so much activity at night and that might be the really best time to go out and explore because snails and slugs are nocturnal. Those guys slither away back to their hiding places during the day. So you might be able to pluck them into a coffee can at night and then, I, well, we like to feed things for our, to our chickens, but if you have opossums where you live, your slug and snail population will be lower because, um, because they eat them. And so if you can put them all in a bucket, uh, although they will crawl out, uh, and leave them someplace remote for those critters, they'll come and eat them all night. Yay. Okay, so uh, fungus gnats. So I just learned a trick from someone who's on this week's podcast, Marcus Bridgewater. He just shared a tip on how to water your plants, your indoor plants, so that you don't get fungus gnats. Because the trick with fungus gnats, they pupate, they live in the soil there, they breed in the soil. And if you can just let the soil dry down, the top inch of soil, they will desiccate and die. Uh, but basically, if you're watering your plant every day or every other day, that's not gonna happen. And so Marcus has this trick of bottom watering where you put the plants in a tub that soaks it up from the bottom and that keeps the top part of the soil uh, dry. So that's kind of cool, you can try that. Also, there's a nematode for fungus gnats. There are predators for fungus gnats and you can use uh, you know, sticky traps or something where you can sort of wipe out a part of the population at once that are attracted to it and they get stuck to it and then you throw that away. But I'm not such a big fan of sticky traps because they're messy and um, and then they have to stand there while they die, which is kind of not great. But anyway, I like to interrupt the life cycle. More about that inside creating a healthy garden. Okay, I have two more questions here so far. Is there any special equipment I need? Oh, right, so there were a couple questions that came in about the course itself. 
uh, are, is there any special equipment I need in order to buy, um, in order to implement what I learned in the course? Um, okay, my fungus gnats are outside. They're really hard. Yeah, so try, try um, for fungus gnats, you're gonna wanna try finding a nematode that will counteract that. Any tips on, I wish I could make these stay up. Sorry guys. Um, any tips on preventing spider mites? Spider mites, I don't know if you were here earlier in the conversation, uh, RM, RWM, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the, so spider mites are also sucking insects. So the trick that I gave about uh, worm castings will also help with spider mites, especially if you do a foliar spray of a worm tea, that helps a lot. Uh, spider mites also show up where there's lack of circulation. So clearing the area, opening up plants, moving stuff out of the way so that you get good airflow will help a lot. Um, and my last resorts are things like neem oil and other sprays. That's the last resort, but worm castings, give that a go. Okay, so I'm going back to the questions. There were a couple questions about the course itself uh, that were you know, related to what people wanted to know about the course. So someone asked, is there any special equipment I will need to buy in order to implement what I've learned in the course? And yeah, one thing I recommend, and I actually related to the last answer I just gave, is that the, um, the, the thing, the one tool that I like to use uh, that I have in my arsenal that costs a little bit of money to buy is a backpack sprayer or a pump sprayer that is not, elect not a plug-in sprayer. It has to be hand pump because uh, that's how I often deliver beneficial nematodes, compost tea, worm tea, etc. So those are the, those, that's the one piece of equipment I think it's worth investing in. You will use it, especially if you're taking my course. Um, can you upgrade to VIP access even if you start an independent study? Oh, right, so there are two levels of, of access that I'm offering with creating a healthy garden. The first is uh, independent study. So for $97, you can uh, go and you know, study at your own pace. And then there's 297, which is independent study plus a half hour one-on-one -on -one with me uh, via Zoom and access to a private Facebook group where we can all work together to solve pest control problems. So you can post a what is this bug picture and then everyone in the group will use the techniques they learn in the course to answer the questions, identify, diagnose, and offer solutions. And I'll be on there too, of course. So uh, I will have answers for you as well. Uh, plus I have a couple of my team members here at Garden Nerd who are helping out as well. And they're on there so uh, that hopefully will answer and answer your question and also if you go to gardennerd.com g-a-r-d-e-n-e-r-d.com slash healthy garden you'll find out all the information you need to know about the course and you can join today's the last day to join by the way it's closing at 6 p.m today so that was oh basically that was it those were the questions that came in uh i want to thank you if you have i think maybe one other question came in let me just see uh, not good to use sticky traps outside, too many, too many pollinators get killed. Exactly. I'm not a big fan of sticky traps, except when it comes to like cucumber squash beetles. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope, well, the replay will be here. If you have other questions you didn't think of while we were talking, you can post them in the comments and I will uh, answer them at some point. But please do me a favor and go to gardennerd.com slash healthy garden. Check out creating a healthy garden online pest control course. See if it's a good fit for you and uh, get in there before 6 p.m. tonight. So hi from Arizona, AMZ Backyard Orchard Vineyard Garden. Yay, welcome. Uh, you can watch the replay and uh, we'll see you all at some other course at some other time. I'll be doing another video soon. Thanks for joining me and I have to figure out how to leave now. <laughs>